right. Well, good evening, everybody. Good to see some of you all in your jerseys, looking good. It's, uh, it's representing your teams, representing the, the people that you hope will win the Super Bowl. And uh, let's get some predictions. Who, who's going to win the Super Bowl this year? Rams, Buffalo, the Chiefs. Yeah? Okay. Uh, anybody want to borrow this and we can just dig a hole now for the Bills? Oh, shoot. Uh, man, sorry about that. Hey, you know, um, last week we started a series called Get to Work, and what I know is that we are right about ready for the preseason, and, and we got a ton of teams that are actually getting to work. They're getting after it and, and doing all kinds of stuff. But hey, before we move on real quick, um, do you guys know what a Cowboys fan does after they win the Super Bowl? You know, you know what they do? They turn off the Xbox and go to bed. It's great. <laughs> it's like, that's, that's what they do. They're just like, yeah, we don't know what that is. So, um, but uh, hey, you know, that's, that's, maybe this year will be different. We don't know. But, uh, you know, we started, a, like I said, a conversation around the idea of work. And what does it mean for, uh, for those of us that follow Jesus to lean into work? And, and w- what does it mean for us to, to honor God in our work? And, and as we talked about it, we said that if you're a Christian, if you follow Jesus, that your work is actually far more than just a paycheck. Uh, your work matters to God. And that we said that a salary, it doesn't indicate the significance of your work to God. Your attitude does. That it's not about the salary that makes it significance. It, it's about your attitude. Because the excellence and the integrity of, of the way that you work is a reflection of God's, of God's character. And it's funny, though, because a lot of us, we get this feeling, particularly right about now, it's like, you know, it's 5.30 on a Sunday night, and, and uh, I applaud you, first off, for coming to church on, on a Sunday night, but we can feel like we're behind the eight ball already before the work week even began, or we can start to look at, at like, the work week and be like, it is going to be a miserable week. It's overwhelming. Like, there's going to be so much that we've got to do, and, and you know, for some of us, uh, we remember TGIF as, like, a thing from when we were growing up as kids. Thank goodness it's Friday, right? Like we could watch Boy Meets World or whatever else was on the TV at that point in time. But see, for those of us that are are leaning in a little bit and, and paying attention to what God's Word has to say for us, I hope that at the end of this series, we're able to say, TGIM, thank goodness it's Monday. And I I tell you that because of what Paul writes to the Colossians when he says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. It's the Lord Christ that you are serving. See, it doesn't matter what company you work for. It doesn't matter what business you work for. It doesn't matter if if you're using a shovel on the job or if you're, uh, you know, crunching numbers in Excel. It doesn't matter what you do. Paul says that we should do it as working for the Lord. And so, you know, this is an interesting idea because a lot of us really, we can get it kind of confused, can't we? We can get it so confused where we say things like, yeah, I get that, but, and then we start inserting, you know, why we feel like work is, is where it is in our lives. Or some of us would even say, you know what, work is just getting the best of me right now. It might be getting the best of your time. It might be getting the best years of your life. You might be feeling like work is just getting the best of you, and it's overwhelming you. Several years ago, um, I went to, I took my kids to, to Disney, and this was not long after the Seven Dwarfs, the Mine Train ride came out. Anybody ridden that one? That's a lot of fun. What a great ride that was. It was, it was tons of fun. And, uh, you know, I've always kind of thought that the dwarfs were like a little bit odd, just like a little weird, you know, but that's like, it's okay. The ride was really fun. You get kind of go out the gate, and then you go through like a couple little hills and turns, and then you get into the, the mine where the dwarfs are working, and they've got, you know, they've got these like really really it's a lot of fun technology in there if you haven't seen it so some of them are like you know they got pickaxes and they're doing their thing and and what are they doing what are they singing right there they're going hi ho hi ho right and they're like going off to work they're like off to work I go and and they're like happy and I'm like I always knew you were weird like like there is there there's something off about these guys because most of us on Monday, we wake up and we're like, I owe, right, I owe. And it's like, that's why we go to work, because of we're digging ourselves out of some crazy hole that we found ourselves in. 
Or we have some, some dream, some aspiration, and we're like, this is what I'm, I'm getting after. And few of us will, will actually see work as something that's meaningful and joyful, and we find ourselves like relegated to the fact that like it's cringeworthy and, and it's this necessary evil. I've got to do it because of either what I've spent or the decisions I've made or this is what's expected of me. This is kind of what we tend to do. And we really tend to separate ourselves from, from our work. And, and so we've got this Venn diagram here. Like, this is your life, right? Like we say, we, and we talked about this last week, so this is kind of catching you up. We say we have our work life and then our, our worship life. We've got the, the secular world, but then also the sacred space. And, and so they never mix, right? Like, we don't want them to mix. We want to kind of keep them separated. This is the work and worship divide. This is kind of what I've been calling it. But the Bible doesn't make any distinction about this. The Bible doesn't say, oh, yeah, yeah, well, when you're working, you know, these, this set of rules apply. Or, or when you're worshiping, this is like a set of ethics that apply over here. No, no, the Bible makes no distinction about that. Because God doesn't want us to just practice our faith on Sunday and then blow it off the rest of the week. And, and that's like kind of business as usual. Jesus is Lord of all seven days of the week. And so the goal for us in this series is to build a bridge between these two spaces and to actually bring them together. Whether you are a corporate office guy, a business person who goes on sales calls, uh, you, you, you're a waiter who fills orders, what you do matters to the rest of us. And the big idea is for us to shift something inside of us, that we shift from seeing um, you know, those of us that uh, may be involved in, in ministry or in, in church world as our job, as being the ones that are more spiritual or spiritually significant to God. We talked about this last week, that actually everything we do is significant to the Lord. All things, all, all professions, they are all people, um, baristas, car salesmen, nurses, insurance agents, executives, like Work is a calling. Students, it's a calling. But God is interested in you. He's interested in the way that you work. Because in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, it says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? See, you can be successful at work. Like, you can be the best that there is in your job. You can make the most money. You can achieve the highest accolades. And, and Jesus says, you can still lose your soul. See, trading ethics for profits will never get you ahead. It's just not going to happen. You have special skills and abilities. I, I believe that. I believe that, that God actually created you to do something specific for him and, and for this world, not, not only to just like uh, make a living, but to make this place a better place, to make the earth uh, a little bit more like heaven. And you've got that role to play. And I don't want you to forget that, that you are working for the Lord, whether that's a job, a career, or maybe you're retired from a career, but you are working in the lives of other people. You're encouraging people. You are, are serving friends and neighbors. See, your everyday vocation, what you put your life towards, what it really should be doing is connecting heaven with earth. And I'm telling you, we're not the first group of people that have ever struggled with our careers. We're not the first group of people that have said, you know what, uh, I, I make a little bit too much out of my work, or um, I, I just can't kind of, I can't leave work behind, or I, I twist work in order to, to achieve the bottom line. Because the Bible in Micah chapter 6, we see an Old Testament prophet who, who really begins to lean in and talk about your work life and, and my work life. And, and Micah was God's prophet, so P-R-O-P-H-E-T, prophet. And, and one of his major themes was actually ethics. It was the ethics, specifically business ethics. See, when Israel was, uh, was going downhill, if you've read through the Old Testament, you can see that Israel had some high points, and then it just was like a slow, maybe sometimes not so slow, decline in, in their ethics, their ethical principles. 
Micah steps in at one of those stages in in verse 9 of chapter 6. He says, listen, the Lord is calling to the city, and to fear your name is wisdom. Heed the rod and the one who appointed it. Am I still to forget, O wicked house, your ill-gotten treasures and the short ephah, which is accursed? So what's a short ephah? Let me, let me help you with this. A short ephah is actually a, a measuring cup. Like an ephah was like how we would say, well, it's a cup or a quart. Uh, it's, a, it's a measurement, a, a form of measurement. And he's saying, you, some of you have shortened the ephah. You've shortchanged people. If you're selling grain in the marketplace and you've got a short ephah, you're going to end up with a, like less grain than what you've paid for. It's like going to Detweilers and saying, I'd like a pound of, of uh, your, your tavern ham, and the, the register reads one pound, but in reality it's three quarters of a pound. He's saying, you have shortchanged people. Shall I acquit a man with dishonest scales, with a bag of false weights? So you notice that Mike is pointing out dishonest scales, false weights. It's not that there's, it's bad that there's a profit to be made. No way. In fact, that's not even close to what, what Mike is talking about. It's the expense at which the profit is made. See, Israel's primary, uh, you know, their primary form of industry was agriculture. So selling grain, wheat, and meat is, is kind of how it looked for them. And we have similar practices today, right? You know, we've got markets, restaurants, delis, these kinds of places. And we understand that something should be, should be right. It should be correct. You know, when I was in high school, uh, this, this actually is like it's a little bit familiar to me. I, I worked as a stonemason's laborer, and uh, basically I slung uh, mortar all day long. I moved stones from one side of a job site to another, back and forth. But there was a guy in my high school that um, was, he, he took a different career path, and he worked at McDonald's. And um, how many of you remember the McDonald's monopoly? Wasn't this a great time of life? Like, this was, this was when you were, like, at the all-time high. You know, students nowadays, like, there's this new trend. It's like, oh, that's so satisfying, right? Like, everything is satisfying. Like, and there was nothing more satisfying than peeling off one of those things off a large fry and just hearing it, like, rip perfectly. And then you flip it over, and it's, like, boardwalk. And you're like, ha, this is amazing, realizing that you're never going to get Park Place. Like, nobody ever got Park Place. Uh, but that's besides the point. He worked at McDonald's, and he worked in the back. Uh, I knew him from high school because, and this is why I knew, because it became very uh, well known that if you went through the, the drive through at the McDonald's just down the road from a high school, and you ordered your order with extra onions, okay? You'd say, you know, whatever it is, like a double cheeseburger, with extra onions, please. They go, okay, marked it down, extra onions. He'd be in the back, and he'd just throw stuff in the bag. You'd be like, an apple pie, a Big Mac, like, you know, who knows, like, whatever, because he's putting the bags together and just going to the window, handing out the door. He was figuring out how he could manipulate his workplace in order to boost his popularity, and people loved him for it, right? But it's dishonest scales. It's dishonest weights. And, and like, you might be thinking, oh, well, McDonald's can afford it, right? They're like a global empire. But dishonesty, it never gets you ahead, right? Like, it's, it's never going to cut it. Dishonest gain is always a setback. It's always a setback, no matter what. See, what did God say to the through the prophet Micah, he, he says, should I acquit someone or, or, or let someone go who's dishonest? This is God's main beef with his people, is that they've actually lost sight of honesty and integrity. See, honesty is doing the right thing. We know that. Integrity is doing the right thing when nobody's watching, when you have control over it. Can you think of people that have been dishonest in your industry? Maybe they've done something that you, you've seen, or um, you know, maybe you can think of somebody, some high-profile cases might come to mind, like, like Bernie Madoff, right? Like, uh, I don't know how we didn't see that one coming. Like, he made off with $65 billion, the largest you know, you know, financial fraud in U.S. history. But here's the deal. The prophet Micah, 
is calling out. He's saying dishonest prophets, ill-gotten treasures. In verse 12, he says this, that her rich men are violent. Like, you need to read some sopranos in here. Like, he's like, his people are liars and their tongues speak deceitfully. Like, there's a suggestion of, of like, some organized crime. And Micah's calling it out. He's saying the rich will do whatever it takes to intimidate their competitors. And some of you in business understand this. It's like the cutthroat dog-eat-dog world, and you know everybody's just doing whatever they can to cut other people's legs out from underneath of them and just to make sure that you come in number one. But Christians, we're not exempt to this. Because Christians, we show up to church on Sunday, and we talk about mercy and grace and then on Monday, we can run, you know, the most ruthless business practices in town. Remember the Israelites that God was, was speaking to, that Micah was speaking to, was God's chosen people. But they ran a business in the way that God never chose for them to do. See, there is a relationship between what God has called you to do and the way that you do that work. You know, this comes back to our, our core motivation for it, though. Like, when we think about why do we work, you know, it's that idea of, like, do, am I working because I owe something, or am I working because I can create something, and I can build something, and I can make this place even better? See, most people are motivated by um, one of three things. You're motivated by profit, kind of like that bottom line, the ability to make money. It's, we're going we're gonna to do something, and we're going to see it be successful, some people are, are motivated by praise. We want to receive compliments. We want to be high-fived and told that we're special and you know, receiving praise from the boss and the applause of others. And then maybe we want to, uh, we're motivated by promotion. We want to advance our career. We want to move into the corner office. We want to have more power and more influence, right? And whether your faith invades your work or your career, as a, if you see it as a calling, you're going to be faced with decisions on a daily basis to determine whether or not what your, or what your motivation will be for. In fact, all of these things are, are good things. Profit is a good thing. Like, for those of you that own businesses or lead businesses, like, I, I pray for, for you as businessmen, businesswomen, that your businesses would be very successful. Because I believe that God has, has called you to do that and to lead it successfully and to make, make money. Uh, you know, praise is not a bad thing. Praise is, is a good thing. In fact, we probably need to be a little bit more liberal with our ability to, to give compliments to people. Promotions are great. Of course, who doesn't love to be promoted? But profit, praise, and promotion, they can be bad when it's our motivation. And the Bible would refer to this as idolatry. Idolatry is anything that you make uh, that matters more to you than the glory of God. You make something in God's place. You know, I might, I might just kind of define it this way, is turning a good thing into a God thing. That can become an idol. And that could be success. It could be money. It could be uh, popularity, the praise of people. But the problem is, that when profit is your idol, you'll inevitably be tempted to cut corners. You'll, you'll find ways to, to fudge numbers and, and to, to manipulate the situation where you can cut the legs out from your competitors. Or, and see, this is what stands behind idolatry. It's the root source. When you make a good thing, into an ultimate thing, it becomes an idol. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with profits, with promotions, and with praise. But it's, it's sin when it takes the place that God has in your life and in mine, that he deserves. And so here's what we know from Micah and from the other prophets, is that your life will be driven by what you worship. That what you set as the center of your life, the, what you worship, what you elevate to the, the highest degree, that will drive your life. 
That will be what you base your decisions on. And, and right now, we live in a culture that worships celebrity, right? Like, we worship celebrity. We know so much about so many people that uh, are, are just, they're famous for being famous. And this penetrates into the deepest parts of our society because we want to be known. We want to ha- make a name for ourselves. We want to show ourselves as being worthy of the promotion and worthy of the title, right? And before you, like, think that I'm, like, high and holy and I'm, casting judgment on you. I want to give you a peek into, the, into, into the my world. Like there, there is every bit of the reality that like we would say things, we might just kind of church it up a little bit and say, uh, well, I want to leave a legacy, right? Like I just want to be known and leave a legacy behind. A, a 17th century theologian, he, he said this, that the role of the pastor is to preach the gospel to die and be forgotten. That flies in the face of a lot of uh, my contemporaries. And, you know, honestly, me, some days. When I'm like, I want to be known. I want to be recognized. I want, you know, whatever it might be. But what what that theologian is saying is to live your life in a way that works hard, that points people to Jesus, and then entrusts them to do that for the next generation. That it's not about my name. It's not about a, a platform. It's not about a promotion. It's not about your, uh, your, your career. It's about what are you doing to point people to Jesus? to point them to the hope in Jesus because your life will be driven by what you worship. And if you worship that, you worship the platform, then you're going to make it about you. But if you worship Jesus, then you're going to use whatever platform God gives you to make it about him. And that could be, that could be your wealth. That could be, uh, God, if, if God gives you a lot of money, man, make it about him and watch as he blesses you. Just watch. If God gives you the ability to, to manage and to lead, man, make it about Jesus and watch as, as you lead and manage in, in incredible ways. You know, 1,500 years ago, St. Augustine said things like dishonesty, stealing, exhaustion, are all those are simple smoke trails to a fire that you can trace back down to the source of idolatry, is what you really worship. And, you know, I would tell you, I'm right there with you. I have a hard time breaking away from my work. Like, I, I am. I, I have a hard time where it's like if I could get in the zone, I'm working hard, and, and I can, I can be, it can be really difficult for me. That's why I've talked so much about, you know, the Sabbath and honoring the Sabbath. And because I know that if I'm not careful, work can be an idol for me. And I can watch workaholism creep in. And I don't know if anybody else relates to that. But here's what I've been working on. Is that my work doesn't define me. Jesus does. Christ does. And I'm not better when I work harder. And God doesn't love me more when I work harder. It's what am I doing with what God has entrusted me with? And the question I have for you is, what are you doing with what God has entrusted you with? Are you working for the praise of men or so that men will praise God? It comes down to the who or what that we worship. So, simple question. Maybe kind of poking the bear a little bit. But do you worship your work? Or do you use your work as a means and a way to worship God? Because the same question that Jesus asked in Mark 8 What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? You can get it all. You can get it all. The house, the boat, the car, the girl, everything. But if you lose your soul, what value does that have? You might be outwardly successful, but inside you feel hollow See, the good news is Malachi 6 shows us before, just before he painted this whole picture, he he gives us a glimpse into 
what we actually can do. In Mal- Malachi 6, verse 8, it says, He showed you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Just to be clear, the Bible isn't saying that we get to heaven by acting ethically. The issue is, how do we live and work in a way that pleases God? And he gives us three things. He says, act justly. We're going to act justly in the workplace. And that means that we're going to treat people fairly. And in business, we're going to apply principles that, that work for the rich and the poor equally. Justice is not taking advantage of unfair advantage of others. And mercy, we're going to love mercy. In the Bible, mercy is often seen as this twin companion of, of justice. Mercy softens the, the rich demands of, of, of society. And, and mercy is usually shown to people in need. It's giving special consideration to those who are hurting. And we're going to walk humbly. Humility is, is an incredible thing for somebody that has power. To not be full of themselves. To not be, you know, you know, the boss that plays God, controlling every person underneath of your thumb. Humility at works, remember that God is God and you are not. And it's pointing to him. See, tonight, I, I look at that list and I say, man, we need, we need, we need more of that. To to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. And here at Hope City, we, we believe that it is all about Jesus. That everything we do is to, to point people to hope in Jesus. Whether you're a barista, you're an engineer, you're an electrician, whatever it is that you do, is to point people to Jesus. And we want to help people act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with their God. And so what we're going to be doing is on September 18th, we are once again a church on the move. And we're going to be meeting uh, Sunday morning services each and every week at Tatum Ridge Elementary School. Because we want to gather together. We want to to launch out of, of Tatum Ridge right before we open the building. You know, we're going we're gonna to do everything that we can to reach this next generation, to be for Sarasota, for, for the one. And so on Sunday, September 18th, I hope that you'll join us. I hope that you'll invite some friends to be with us. And we're going to be doing that at Tatum Ridge in such a way that we're going to build and develop community. We're going to, to, um, to see some healthy things form and practices form because God has called us to point people to the hope in Jesus your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, those people whose lives you intersect with and that you work with. But in order to to get ready for the day that when we have that grand opening, we want to start having Sunday morning services. And and we're going to do this because we want to see more people know Jesus. And so I want to ask you, who, who are you going to invite with you to join you on September 18th at Hope City Church? Who's going to come with you, and and who is God placing on your heart for that? You know, we're believing that that God is going to, you know, see us through this building, and it's going to be, um, you know, in this year, we're praying and asking God to do that. We're full steam ahead with that. This isn't a this isn't like a a, a, a detour. We just know that God has work for us to do. We know that that there are things that we need to do. We need to encourage people and and point people to the hope in Jesus. And we're gonna do whatever we can, as much as we can, to point people back to him. Tonight, you know, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to do, I believe, which is one of the most important things that you can do. And that is to get in a group. Because when you get connected in a group, you're going to find yourselves shoulder to shoulder with people who are similar to you. Maybe they work a little bit different job than you, but they're doing it just the same as you. And they get to encourage you and speak into your life and help you see what God has to say for your life. They get to, to, to cheer you on as you walk through this life and work and worship God together.
So tonight in the lobby, you're gonna find some of our connect group leaders. They've got lanyards on with whistles and badges and all this stuff. And you'll see different ways that you can sign up. I encourage you, do not leave this place tonight without getting in a group and finding your team.